I didn't realize that we couldn't overcome it with a hot spot. We really tried. Okay, here we go. Uh, well, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Patrick Milliken from the Poison Pen Bookstore here in Scottsdale, Arizona. And uh, I am joined by William Martin, whose brand new book is called December 41. Got copies right here. And also Zach Topping, who uh, I was just telling Zach, we haven't received our copies of his brand new book, Wake of War, yet. But uh, thanks for holding that up for us. We should be getting that very soon. And Zach tells me he just had a, a, a really nice debut launch, very exciting launch uh, event last night. So uh, gentlemen, welcome. It's great to have you with us. And great Barbara here, Peters, Barbara Peters, the disembodied voice, is joining us from Santa Fe, New Mexico. Hey, Barbara. <laughs> Hey, Patrick. I'm very sorry, everybody, but Santa Fe has experienced a complete internet blackout since 11 o'clock this morning, and there's just no way that I can get into Zoom, but I am happy to be able to um, to at least talk. I was so much looking forward to this event in person, but um, we'll just have to make do because technology being what it is. Um, we have veteran author William Martin, whom I've always wanted to meet, and a, a brand new author called Zach Topping. Um, who apparently had a successful event last night, so maybe he'll be all primed with cool questions that I will forget to ask. Yay, is that true? Which one of you is which? Because I can only tell by your voice. Jack, Zach, which one are you? Uh, I'm Zach. Okay, hi. And congratulations, hi. son. Thank you very on much. On a road to publication. You bet. It's always interesting. Patrick uh, will probably want to ask you about that because we always find it fascinating to learn author stories about how they get to publication. Mr. Martin, uh, you've won, written wonderful books, Back Bay City, City of Dreams, The Lost Constitution, The Lincoln Letter, Bound for Gold, um, and apparently a PBS documentary on the life of George Washington and a cult classic horror film. You seem to be a person of really diverse interests. That's right. Well, uh, I, when I was at the film school at USC long ago, I had a professor who said, professional writers write doesn't matter whether uh, it's something that you want to write or it's an assignment that comes along. You open your mind and you sit down and you do the best job that you can. And uh, I tried to do the best job that I could on that horror movie, which has probably been seen by more people than have read all of my books. Uh, <laughs> but I found that writing books was a much better way to uh, spend my time. Well, I'm certainly glad that you did. What's the title of your horror movie? Nobody's mentioned that in the publicity. Well, I usually try to keep that under wraps. I took my name off that <laughs> movie, even though I do get, <laughs> even though I do get miles of publicity from it uh, when I go out to talk about new books. Uh, the movie was called Humanoids from the Deep. Uh, it starred Vic Morrow, Doug McClure, and a lot of other people. Uh, that you might recognize, and a bunch of guys in rubber suits dressed as humanoids who terrorize a, <laughs> a California town. However, I love it. It was Roger yes. Corman's College of B Movie Knowledge, and uh, everybody studied with Roger Corman at some point when they were getting started in the 70s and 80s. He's and still kicking, too. Well, he is. He's way into his 90s now. I know somebody who writes for him. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Well, uh, I, I hope he gets paid better than I did. <laughs> I don't think he is. <laughs> well, you know, in the strange way that publishing goes through cycles, genre cycles, I've actually given a lot of thought to this. And, you know, there's sort of like a 20-year cycle role where, you know, historical fiction goes up and crime fiction goes down and whatever. And currently we're beginning to experience or have been for a little while a rise in horror and arise in what I call the new Gothic, um, which is a really old form, but suddenly it's become hot again. And I find it, I find it so interesting. I attribute it to like a whole new generation of readers. So Zach, you're writing in a, um, you know, a, a future uh, mode because your book is, I don't want to call it, what would you call it? I don't want to call it dystopian war fiction, but do you think that's what it is? I suppose, I mean, that's, a pretty apt description. I, it's a near future military thriller, um, but at its heart, it's a cautionary tale. Uh, it toes the line between sort of near future sci-fi and, and current um, alternate history, maybe. 
Uh, I try to keep it as realistic as possible to ground it in reality, to give it some weight and really kind of dissect some of the things that, uh, you know, at the time when I wrote it, the first draft in 2017, it was just a, a, a far-fetched idea that I remember kind of wondering if anyone would even buy into the prospect of another second American civil war and like, but there's all these rules in place and laws and systems that it would never happen. And then, you know, you're watching horror and, over the, and now, and then we had Trump. Right. And yeah. you know, it, it is interesting. It's almost prescient, but what's interesting is that Mr. Martin's book, which is, or should I call you Mr. Martin? Or do you want me to call you William? What's you the right thing here? Bill. Bill. Okay. So Bill's book is, even though it's a war novel is basically, um, not filled with hope, but at least, you know, it talks, it, it's attributed in lots of ways to the American character and the fact that the Germans have underestimated it. Um, and, um, you know, so it leaves you at the end with a, a feeling of optimism. Of course, we know that, you know, how the war came out. Whereas your book, Zach, I think takes the other tack and, you know, leaves us in something of despair over what we're going. So they were interesting books to read back to back, which is what I did. Um, and I certainly hope that that Bill's book has, has better a better view of the future than yours. But we'll have to see, won't we? Right, well, and, and that was kind of the the idea. Is that I, my hope is that when you put the book down, it gives the reader, it gives all of us something to think about because it's a future that doesn't exist yet, and it's a, and if it's in the future, it doesn't have to exist. So, sort of try to ask those questions and, and see if we can, you know, we have still a chance to find another way. Hopefully. Well, I agree with you that it is a cautionary tale. I'm sorry, Bill, did you want to add something? And, and by the same token, uh, when you're looking into the past rather than into the near future, as Zach does, you're always looking, uh, or at least I am always looking, to find examples of the kind of uh, of heroism and commitment and and dawning sense of the significance of the roles that they are playing among ordinary Americans who are the people who helped to take down the uh, the villain in December 41. Uh, and the idea behind that is that if we can look to history and find the positive examples of history and of people just like us, a hundred years ago dealing with some terrible crisis or 70 years ago dealing with some terrible crisis. Well, we may be able to deal positively with whatever is coming, even if it's an American civil war in 2037, which I sure hope it isn't, of course. Right. So uh, well, Zach and I are kind of two sides of the same coin here, I think. Well, I think you're right. I mean, as I said, it was interesting to read them Together now, um, I'm an historian by training, and I've always been fond of the great man school of history. You know, that one person um, can really shape events. And you're certainly dealing with two amazing figures. You're dealing with FDR and you're, you know, sort of dealing with Churchill. But yes. I've always thought that the British would have lost the war if it hadn't been for Churchill, who more or less, you know, held them together when I think many of them might have just collapsed or or sold out, um, well, and sorry, go ahead. I've often thought about that, and I think that the most influ influential man of the 20th century is Adolf Hitler, uh, because of the changes that he brings about in the middle of the century, uh, and the most significant man of the 20th century uh, the greatest man of the 20th century is Winston Churchill because he stops Hitler and he stops Hitler's influence before it can uh, can basically destroy Western democracy. Uh, so there's uh, the, the, the evil man brings out the greatness in the men uh, in the men around him, including in church, including Churchill. Well, I think you're right. And, you know, I thought on page 77 that you really made a, a wonderful case for why um, so many Germans seems to us now inexplicably embraced Hitler and Nazism. Um, and, you know, you're you're talking about Martin Browning, who's your your um, German assassin who is yes. working his way from Los Angeles across the country. And, you know, you're, you're saying um 
it would be a mercy to end this war quickly. Fewer deaths recorded, fewer resources wasted, fewer world historical treasures destroyed, fewer Bolsheviks befouling Europe, an equitable balance restored between Germany and the rest of the world. But then you go on to say, you know, a country stabbed in the back by its own leftists in 1918, then abused by the Allies at Versailles, would once again assume its honorable place as a leader of nations. And, you know, I can't help but compare that to some of what we're seeing with the far right today in this country. Um, you know, and, and, and I thought you made a really interesting case there for why people did embrace Hitler when looking back on it, you have to wonder what you know, why in the world would they have done it? Well, I, I worked hard to pack a lot of reasons into a very short span of uh, uh, page space there in that particular passage. But it was yep. important to give him that kind of motivation. And if you hear if you hear something there that uh, that reminds you of today, well, you know, as somebody once said, history may not repeat itself, but it sure does echo on a regular basis. <laughs> Well, it really does. And, you know, Zach has some of the same things going on with his characters. Your sniper, the the young woman who's bent on vengeance and, you know, some other people say, why did you choose Salt Lake City? I'm completely fascinated by that. You obviously are not a big fan of the great Salt Lake, but um, that's an interesting setting to, you know, to sort of achieve your pitch battle in the book. Oh, no, I uh, I love Salt Lake in Salt Lake Valley. Um, and I chose it actually. Uh, when I, I first came up with the idea of, of writing a, a story about uh, a civil war, I knew the setting was going to be important, obviously, and where it had to be located in, in somewhere that was familiar and made sense to the terrain and the tactics and all that. Um, but I tried a couple different places and they just didn't click. And I was thinking about it after when I left the army in 2007, I spent a couple of years kind of trying to get my head right find maybe where I belonged in the world and, and what my path was. And if I had a path, it was, it was kind of a tumultuous time, uh, you know, mentally and emotionally and, and uh, just all the things that come with trying to reintegrate into what's considered a normal lifestyle after the, you know, couple last few years that I'd lived. Uh, and it was, I would took a trip to Salt Lake to uh, visit some friends and, while I was out there, I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a spiritual person, but the entire trip, it, it was just, it was utterly moving, right? The, the enormous landscape, the vastness of it, the city itself, something about my time out there just clicked. And I actually attribute where I am today, sort of, I mean, among many other things, but that was, that visit to Salt Lake was a turning point in my life. And I, oh, I, I always look fond agree with you that. Yeah, the valley really is beautiful. I mean, I think Utah is the most, in many ways, the most beautiful state in the country. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the red, I mean, I live just south of Sedona and, you know, the entire Western Red Rock um, yep. landscape is remarkable and the valley that Salt Lake City, uh, but it's ideal for the story you were writing because, you know, it is a valley. It's kind of a bowl. Right. And, and the setting is, I mean, where, where have we seen, uh, I mean, of course, it's the near future. So we imagine the city's far more densely populated as, as um, you know, populations move from widely dispersed areas into centralized locations. So densely packed cityscapes surrounded by mountainous valleys filled with rebels. I mean, that's kind of, that's a, that's a very common uh, setting in a lot of these conflicted places across the globe. And also because Salt Lake for me was, uh, a beautiful place, I thought, it, what better, what, you know, what an apt metaphor to destroy something that I found beautiful and really emphasize just the, the grotesqueness of war, because the book is, it's, I mean, Wake of War is an anti-war book, right? It's not promoting war. It's right. not gratuitous violence. It's, it's, uh, I really wanted to emphasize some of those, those uh, more painful parts. So, so that's why I chose Salt Lake for, for that. Well, yeah, I think I think you paint apocalypse that we would rather not see. So, yeah, I agree with you. Bill, I thought your letter that came with the advanced reading copy of December 41 was absolutely fabulous. I make it a point to throw away everything the publisher sends me and just read a book because I don't want anybody to tell me what I should think about it. But when I was through, I read your letter and I was just blown away. Um, I did love it, as you suggest in the first sentence. 
And I like what you said. I know that I like to write on a broad canvas about high stakes with a big idea driving me from the first scene to the climax. And this time, I found it all at the movies. So tell us about that. That's right. Well, it was the movie Darkest Hours with um, uh, Gary Oldman playing Winston Churchill. And he's on the telephone to FDR, begging FDR for uh, assistance because it's May of 1940. France is falling. The Germans are advancing on the British at Dunkirk. And FDR tells him in this phone call, I can't help you because American politics ties my hands. And as I watched that scene and watched Gary Oldman as Churchill slumping in his chair in despair afterward, I thought to myself, right after Pearl Harbor, uh, on December 24th, 1941, Churchill and FDR will stand together on the south portico of the White House to light the national Christmas tree and express their alliance in their war against fascism. Uh, Churchill will be completely enthused by his new relationship with the United States. As he says on December 8th, I went to bed last night and slept the sleep of the saved and thankful. And there he will be on December 24th to light the Christmas tree with Churchill, with FDR, and what a target they will make. That that idea, what a target they will make, popped into my head, and it was like a lightning strike. A lot of novels emerge from uh, years of thought, from long spans of contemplation of the ocean, uh, like the book I wrote about Cape Cod. But this book was a pure lightning strike. I knew right away that I had a terrific idea, uh, what they call in Hollywood a high concept. A German assassin is going to evade an FBI dragnet on the day after Pearl Harbor in Los Angeles, where the FBI was arresting the Germans and Japanese. And he's going to make his way to Washington, D.C. in order to shoot Roosevelt and Churchill that night. Does he make it? Well, if you've read any of my books, you know that uh, I... My characters never change history, but they are changed by history. However, when he gets there and the Christmas carols are playing and the speeches are unrolling and he's running around on the uh, White House grounds, you'll be turning pages saying, oh, man, I hope he doesn't kill Roosevelt. I hope he doesn't kill Churchill. (laughs) We'll be in such terrible shape if he does. And that's part of my job. And part of the job of the the characters that I have put around him who carry him along as he is pursued across America. Are you I'm, glad, I'm, glad you, huh? I'm glad you like the letter too. Well, I think the letter is fabulous. And I want to come back and talk in a minute about, um, about Rick. And because I thought it was wonderful the way you um, use what turns into um, Casablanca as a sort of through line in the book. But what I did want to tell you was that, you know, one of the things I have found somewhat baffling about growing older is that my life has turned into history and things that I lived through have become historical things. But in fact, your climax of your book takes place a day after my first birthday. So I wasn't there, you know, in in actual sight to, um, you know, to see it. But but what was interesting to me is that you told me so many things about those those years when I was just a child that I I never knew. You know, it was going on around me, but because I was too young, um, and also because it's really hard to see whole historical events. You know, they come to you in sort of bits and pieces, and it's only years later that you can look back and kind of put that mosaic together and understand what happened. But that's that was one of the reasons I think I was so taken with your book is that you illuminated I mean, you know, the, the German-American boom to Los Angeles. I, I grew up in Chicago, so I knew that Wisconsin and to some degree Missouri was, um, you know, were places where there were large German populations and, and a lot of country. I never thought about Los Angeles as being right. a, that place. 
Um, well, my husband is Jewish, and you know, I never really thought about the Jewish organization that you mentioned uh, did so much in Southern California. So, mm-hmm. did you, you know, how do you go about finding those things? I mean, you're up, you're probably younger than I am. Obviously, I've told you I'm almost eighty-two. Um, how do you how do you find those things? Well, uh, I like to consider myself uh, a middle-aged old pro. Um, <laughs> Friends have said to me, uh, you're only middle-aged if you're planning to live to be 144 at this point. So um, I, I basically have a mind like a, uh, like a sponge, and I absorb uh, whatever I read. And I started reading in, it might have been the Smithsonian Magazine, about the German-American Bund in Southern California about five or 10 years ago. And I said, someday I'm going to come back to that. And someday I'm going to use that material uh, because it was quite interesting to, to to discover that right off of Sunset Boulevard in Los Angeles, out in the Pacific Palisades area of Los Angeles, you can find that compound that the FBI raids. Uh, they neo-fascists of that era bought a 55-acre plot from Will Rogers, of all people. Not that he knew what they were going to do with it. And they they built down in this canyon power plant, fuel tanks, concrete stairwells. Oh, there you are. Hello, there Bob. I am. All of a sudden, it came back as you were talking. I'm so yeah. glad to see you both. Yeah. Well, anyway, I, I, I read about that compound where they have engaged an architect to build a 40-room mansion that was to have been Hitler's Western White House. And I thought, someday I'm going to use this. And that was, uh, that was how I came to uh, write uh, the opening and began to research the, the Bund of Southern California. And, you know, we talk about uh, a civil war coming in 2037 in Zach's book. Well, these people in the 1930s were planning for Der Tag, the day, the day when Germans everywhere uh, in Germany and in the United States and everywhere would rise up and essentially foment a civil war. And they were doing things like planning to rob the armories up and down the West Coast and arm disaffected uh, veterans from the First World War. Uh, they were planning to kidnap Jewish movie executives, uh, Jack L. Warner, Louis B. Mayer, etc., kidnap them all one morning on their way to work and take them all up to a park uh, in above Los Angeles and hang them all. These people were bonkers, but they were very dangerous. And when we talk about history repeating itself or, or echoing, you know, uh, these dangerous and bonkers people may still be around. And so uh, as you begin to absorb all of that, all of that texture, uh, you start digging deeper and deeper. And then you find that you have something really pretty interesting to work with. Well, you really make us aware of the dangers within. And I was thinking, you know, you're looking back at real things and then imagining some dangers within. For Zach, you know, you're you're making up the whole thing. But in part, that's informed by stuff that's really happened, right? I mean, it's not 100% your imagination in play in Wake of War. You know, yeah, correct. Um, obviously, it's all fiction, uh, but it's it's clearly, it's heavily inspired by a lot of my own experiences in the military and my you know time overseas, um, either things that I've seen or been through or know of others who've gone through. Um, you know, I'm not the care. I my mother thinks I'm the characters in the book. I'm not, um, it, but they're all derived of me and from me in one way, shape, or another, informed by uh, real world experiences and things that people really are experiencing. Um, one of the inspirations for writing the book came from watching a documentary called winter on fire about the Maidan revolution in Ukraine in 2013, 2014. I think it's, it's on Netflix. Um, and you know, it was on the eve. They were the, they were going to sign an agreement to join the European union and Vladimir Putin met with the president 
behind closed doors and they backed out of the deal. Um, so everybody was gathered in Maidan Square to celebrate when they found out the news and they started, you know, they were obviously extremely disappointed, started protesting, calling for the president's resignation. And those protests quickly turned violent after Russian-backed uh, security forces, the Burkett, came in and just started, you know, causing havoc. And it was, it was terrifying and, and at the same, amazing and terrifying to see how quickly civility can just get yanked away in violence and chaos and someone looking to capitalize on this tumultuous situation can just come in and fill that void. But while watching it, I was like, wow, thank God that's on the other side of the planet. I mean, you, my heart breaks for those people. It's terrible. And then especially now when you see where it, where the world is now, where the, the Ukraine is and the people of Ukraine. But I started thinking about what if it wasn't on the other side of the world? What if it did happen here? And like I said, that was back in 2016 or 27, early 2017 when I thought of that. And I wrote the first draft of Wake of War that year. Um, but... Yeah, I mean, obviously, very much inspired by real things because I wanted to have it grounded in reality to to really give it that gut punch that kind of asks the reader to to pause and think about it. I mean, at this point in time, it's unfortunate, but I'm sure a good number of people out there in the world know have either been through that or know someone who has, and maybe this is a way to kind of uh, through a, like some sort of maybe for catharsis for some and, and, you know, seeing things differently for others. Uh, but I, I really wanted to keep it real. And that was, that was sort of my, my influence in, in motivational writing is make sure it stayed more grounded in reality, although it was in the future. Was that your first, uh, your first attempt at a novel or had you written anything before that? I I've written, um, you know, the, the requisite trunk novels and practice rounds um, that were all like horribly derivative of, of everything that I loved and aspired to do, which is just par for the course. Um, but I, I knew, I, I, did, I wish I could remember the moment where I decided I wanted to try to see if I could write something that could get traditionally published. At first, it was just, I, I've just always loved reading and been and have an active imagination. I've always been compelled to just think up things and, and write stories or write down character sketches or write down ideas. So I just did that because I was compelled to until it got to a point where I'm, I realized it was a craft that you can work at. It's a skill you can develop and get better at. So I started, you know, applying myself, trying to learn the craft and realized that I was doing something wrong. So I throw that draft out and then start another one. I don't know. I don't have an exact number, but you know, enough to go away that, I mean, to, to store and, and kind of, sharpen the edge there until I got to the point where I knew I was ready to, to, I felt like I was ready to write something that I would, I would be not I, comfortable is the wrong word, but I was ready to bring it out and, and show it to, to other people and see where it could go. And somehow, uh, somehow it's, it's worked out. Now, I'm sorry, Bill, go ahead. Well, I was going to ask him, uh, Zach, did, did you take any writing courses or was it, are you entirely self-taught? Because I can, I can see, uh, uh, I can see a real writer in, in your book. Oh, wow. Somebody who's got a real taste for uh, the drama and also for the, the detailing that, that creates the reality that keeps a reader turning pages. Well, that's uh thank you, Bill. That's a huge compliment. Um, that's, <laughs> I really appreciate that. I sort of self-taught isn't quite right. I didn't take a creative writing class until after I'd finished writing Wake of War and I was talking to my agent and we spent some time going back and forth over revisions and discussing ideas for a little while before he offered representation. Uh, but I felt at that point, like I should probably, I was taking um, college courses, night courses after, you know, I'd work during the day and then take classes at night. I was like, I should let's take a creative writing course just because I feel like it's something I should do. And it, there's always room to learn. I mean, I, hopefully I have a long career of writing many more books in, you know, 15, 20, 30 years from now, I'm still learning the craft, still sharpening the craft. But I, I took one creative writing class in a community college. Everything else was just immersing myself in, in the craft, going to following writers and, and industry professionals on social media coming out of my shell because I'm a very sort of reclusive person like speaking publicly and coming out and admitting my passions is something I'm yeah. not particularly comfortable with I'm getting more comfortable with but uh, going to 
conventions and interviews and, and just kind of studying the craft that way until. Yeah. Yeah. So did, did you go to things like Thriller Fest with the international thriller writers or? Uh... I haven't been to Thriller Fest. No, I, st I was going to Boscone in Boston. That's the uh, science fiction fantasy writers convention in, yeah. uh, every February. Uh, and I was going there for a few years and that's where I met my agent and uh, I'm going to Worldcon in Chicago this September. So just kind of, I haven't been to too many. In fact, that's it. Yeah. Just bots going and it'll be Worldcon. Will be well, the you, next. Might, you might run into my son. He's uh, he writes games. And so he's, uh, oh, yeah. he shows up at a lot of those things too. Okay. He's just a Star Trek game. All right. I'll keep an eye out for him. I might've well, passed you for those of you at Poison Pen who are uh, also interested in games and sci-fi, uh, yeah. the game is Star Trek Resurgence, and that'll be out in December. Oh, Very awesome. Cool. We'll look that up. Yeah. Renaissance. Oh, that's really cool. Am I, am I actually back in this meeting? I'm sorry, yeah. but it, yeah, can you, you hear me? Oh, good. Yes. I decided that the internet is so unstable, it was better to go back to my phone, which is really testing my husband. But there we go. Um, <laughs> and I apologize for all this, but obviously there's nothing I can do about it. Um, one point I wanted to raise, Bill in particular, but I think that Zach does it well too, is how you take um, small things. And, you know, it's hard to see an enormous canvas uh, without without the ability to see small pieces of it. And I thought one of the things that you did best uh, was when you're in Musso and Frank, um, where Kevin Kusek is gone. And I remember Musso and Frank because the first time I went to Los Angeles to spend some time with Michael Connolly, he insisted that we go to Musso and Frank because it's so legendary. Yeah. But, you know, you're, you're you have this picture of Bogart sitting there, um, you know, by himself. And, you know, um, and then you, you sort of bring in everybody comes to Rick and Rick's and and gradually we realize that in point of fact that we're really talking about Casablanca, which is kind of a through line in, in your book. Um, right. The, and, and I thought that was so wonderful. Why did you, you know, I mean, that's real history that you're right. using to, you know, illustrate what's going on. Why did you pick on that particular? You're spending some time in a writer's room in Los Angeles. I assume this is your own experience. But um, do you think is Casablanca so famous, so well known that you thought everybody would relate to that? I I think so. I the book originally was to have been titled December eighth, nineteen forty one, and and that that uh, because that's when it begins. It begins with Roosevelt's speech. Uh, it's a critical day in human history, the day that the United States officially enters World War II. Uh, of course, it didn't make sense because the book is going to go, is, isn't going to climax until December 24th. Uh, but December 8th is significant on the world stage because of those political events. And it is also, if you're a student of American pop culture, uh, it is also significant because the script to the play, Everybody Comes to Rick's, arrived at Warner Brothers that morning and was assigned to a young reader uh, like Kevin Cusack, my fictional character. And when I, when I read about that, I just thought that it's almost too perfect an irony that this, this play, which would become uh the movie that in a way still echoes to us about world war ii perhaps more than any other of the movies made in hollywood during the war itself uh this movie in which there are no battle scenes and and uh two gunshots i think or maybe three um that this movie would would re resound to us today as i think it does uh, one of the most beloved movies and one of the most uh, impactful movies in our culture. And I didn't want to write a love triangle in this book. There's a love triangle, but it gets dispensed with fairly early. However, the big theme uh, that you hear in my book, I hope, is also the big theme in, um, in Casablanca. Remember the great scene where Bogart has met Ingrid Bergman, Ilsa, for the first time in a couple of years, he's now 
uh, sitting with a bourbon bottle and Sam is in the background tinkling on the piano uh, and they're lit in that beautiful lighting that they have in the, in the film. And Bogart is saying, Sam, it's December 1941 in Casablanca. What time is it in New York? And Sam says, I don't know. My watch has stopped. And Bogart says, I bet they're asleep in New York. I bet they're asleep all over America. And that line kind of echoes through the book because in this book, you see a lot of people waking up uh, and doing what Bogart will do by the end of the movie, which is to find the steel in his spine, make the hard decision. And that's what I wanted to build into all of the characters in this book, that they all make a hard decision at some point. And, um, and that, you know, it just became a perfect hand in glove kind of uh, metaphor to introduce that movie and tell you a little bit of the truth about how it developed in those first few weeks of the war and then get back to my story. Yeah, I thought it worked absolutely perfectly. And my yeah. understanding of Casablanca is that part of it sort of developed as they made it, that, that you know, it didn't have a, a 100% script that it kind of, no. Um, no. it was ad-libbed in some parts, right? But the, the well, the source material, it, and the, the, the multiple characters who uh, we have come to know and love, Rick and, uh, and Ilsa and uh, uh, the, the police lieutenant and even Major Strasser, um, they, they were all there in the story to begin with, perhaps with different names. And it wasn't so much that anything was ad-libbed as that the, uh, the Epstein twins who wrote most of it, were working sometimes a few hours before uh, a particular scene might be shot. And then Hal Wallace, the producer, uh, Hal Wallace came up with the line, Louis, this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship, which is the line you hear at the end of the, uh, the movie, one of the most famous and echoing lines of them all. Uh, but the other idea in in talking a lot about that movie is that Americans are in love with their popular culture uh, in the 1940s, perhaps in the same way that they are today. And the rest of the world may mis misinterpret that love of popular culture as, uh, as, as frivolity. And uh, when the moment comes and Americans are called upon, they are not quite that frivolous after all. The other thing is I wanted you to feel like you were in the midst of a black and white Hollywood movie uh, from the <laughs> 1940s as you read this book. And so uh, I felt free reign to make reference to 1940s Hollywood movies. That's why that's why the cover of the book is in black and white. Zach and I yep. may have the only two books that are out right now. Hold yours up that are in black and white. We're, we're uh, like bookends here. It's uh, it's perfect. Um, Zach must have a reason why his cover is in black and white too. Uh, yeah. Well, I have some uh, phenomenal had some phenomenal uh, cover artists. Uh, yeah. This isn't at all like I, I I had no hand in in coming up with this design, but it was right. it was awesome when I saw it. Yeah. And I gotta say, I'm gonna break myself over the coals. I'm not particularly uh, well versed in movies from the 40s. But mm -hmm. I have to say, I mean, reading the book, I, I I got that aesthetic. I felt like I was watching. I saw that and the the tension on the train and whenever you know yeah. the way everyone comes together and those references that I did pick out. That was it was really good. Yeah, good. very well, well done. And another, I, I thought another interesting parallel, you know, thing that both of you um, wrote about in your books is the role of a key young woman. So in Bill's book, there's a, a young woman we call Vivian, although. You know, we learn eventually who she really is. And in your book, you've got your, um, is it Samantha? Is that her name? Yep. Sam, Samantha Cross. Yep. She goes by Sam. Right. And they, yep. they both play pivotal roles. And, um, you know, I, I found that fascinating that their personal lives and their, their own hopes and dreams and skills and so forth were important parts of the story. Um, obviously, they're both fictional, but um, why did you decide? Um, Bill, why did you decide to 
bring Vivian into this story and give her the role that you did because it's fascinating. Well, the, the Vivian Hopewell, it's a name she's given herself uh, when she's gotten to Hollywood, uh, is, a, is a failed actress. Uh, one of those girls who basically thinks that just because uh, she's pretty, uh, if she can only get to Hollywood and get in front of a camera, her life will be changed. And she discovers the hard realities uh, of life when she's in Los Angeles. And we meet her uh, after she's just been rejected from a waitressing job in Burbank, right across the street from the uh, Burbank studio, what is today, the Burbank studios in, in those days was Warner Brothers. Uh, and I wanted somebody who was down on her luck, who was at the end of the line and just wanted to go home. And that's uh, that's who she is. And that's when she meets that German assassin who was looking for somebody to give him a little bit of cover as he heads off across America. And he thinks this girl could play a perfect wife to me. And uh, I will use her and manipulate her. And uh, she'll think she's giving a performance and uh, it's I that am giving the performance. And of course, uh, a kind of psychological dynamic begins to develop between the two of them that I won't, that I won't give away until, uh, um, until you read the book. But, uh, right, I, but, but yeah, go ahead. Now, I was just going to say you have her playing a role, perhaps not the role of her dreams, but, you know, she, she is playing a role. Um, it's she's role acting. a lifetime for her. Yep. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it furthers this whole this whole um, Hollywood, you know, sort of thing that you were just talking about. Zach, why did you decide to introduce Samantha and her story into, I mean, it's a military thriller. So why did you decide to give her a role in the role that you gave her? Well, from the beginning, I knew that I wanted to tell the story in a way that made it difficult to decide who was right and wrong. Um, and I want to tell the, the book, there are three main point of view characters. Uh, there's James Trent is a U.S. Army soldier. Sam Cross is a rebel sniper. And then Marcus and his crew are, are freelance um, private security contractors. So they one is government, one is civilian, and one occupies that nebulous space in between where they, they used to be military, but they're civilians now, but all they, they identify as their you know, what they've done in life. They don't really know where they belong, but something I tried, another thing I tried to keep in mind while writing, it was the idea that no matter how heinous somebody's ideas are, I mean, we were talking about Hitler earlier, Hitler thought he was in the right. No one ever thinks they're the villain. Um, not to say that there aren't villains, but in that moment, no one thinks that it's them. They think everyone else, you know, their agenda is the right one. Um, but Sam Cross and James Trent are, are polar opposites of each other, right? Not only, I mean, do they occupy different sides of the, the battle space, but, you know, I mean, even doubt there, there are a lot of different subtleties without going, giving away too much. But I mean, even from the fact that one's a male, one's a female, one's in the fights for the government, one fights for uh, the rebel movement. But Sam Cross is, uh, she's a, a strong-willed, self-reliant, tough, uh, 19 year old self-taught sharpshooter. And I, I mean, she's a human being just like everybody else in this story is tightly focused on the characters, which something, another thing I, I tried to avoid going too in depth of the overall politics of the world. Um, because the point of the story, obviously there's a lot of this speculation. We can, we can, I could have written a story that went into the politics, the broad spectrum where you have the generals moving pieces across the board. But I wanted this to be really focused on the people in the ground, on the ground, you know, in the trenches that it doesn't matter why they're there because whatever their opinion on why they're there doesn't necessarily matter because they're there and now they have to do what they have to do. But at the same time, if we just keep believing that, like, well, I'm just following orders or I'm just doing what I'm told, or this is the only way for me to get this thing that I need. Um, you know, it might not have the outcome you want. And Sam's motivation for getting involved in the fight, you know, you learn she lost a lot 
um, at the hands of the government, the government that she, when she was even younger, she actually idolized. If, if things hadn't gone the way they did, she might've been on that side. She might've been a soldier, but things turned out differently. And she was left alone and filled with rage and resentment and anger. And so she turned those, that emptiness in her into this need for vengeance. And so she joins the fight thinking that, you know, taking that rage out is going to fill that hole. Um, but very quickly, you know, you start to learn that maybe that's not necessarily true. So, but yeah, well, uh, the, you char- know the characters Every... pull opposites. Yep. I'm sorry, go ahead and finish your thought. No, I was just, I was just rambling, summarizing the char- Each of the characters <laughs> occupy a different side of the spectrum and they're all facing each other from opposite ends until they converge. Well, you know, you know any what, really Barbara, great thriller. Hmm? Barbara, you know what? You know what else happens sometimes? Uh, we're talking about creating an interesting character. Uh, and in this case, an interesting female character. Uh, and, and Zach may have encountered this in his book. I have found it multiple times. Sometimes you say to yourself, you know, I need somebody else here. And about halfway through the book, uh, I felt that I needed another strong female in the book because uh, Vivian was the only female who was really holding the book together. And on walks a character who is a lot more like that 1940s uh, uh, tough guy's girlfriend type. Um, pretty tough herself, a real almost like Rosalind Russell and his girl Friday, Stella Madden. And she's the only female private detective in Los Angeles. And once I put her on the ground, she took the book over, basically, every scene that she was in. And there is nothing more satisfying uh, than, than introducing a character who wants to take the book over like that. And uh, it's an experience, Zach, that uh, you may have had with this book. And uh, if you keep writing, you'll have it in uh, in subsequent books i can guarantee you the excitement of creating a character who suddenly has a life of their own that's so interesting because you know readers always think that it was all planned out and you know it's not spontaneous and whatever it is well and it's so interesting to talk to writers and discover how much um develops during the writing process that wasn't necessarily um you know, planned from the beginning, but you yes. know, in any in any really great thriller, it's 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 a journey. I mean, it's different than a conventional mystery is more an investigation, whereas a really a thriller is really basically a contest. You know, you've got a protagonist and an antagonist, and and the really great thrillers hinge as much on the villain as they do on right. the hero. But the journey is important, and I did think, um, and you say this so well, Bill, in your your letter. The manhunt is on, sweeping us from Hollywood's watering holes to the luxurious Santa Fe Super Chief to Washington, D.C. We see a nation awakening from isolation from the distractions of swing movie and music to confront the harsh reality of war. But, the, you know, your book does move from Southern California from one coast to the other. Um, and, you know, and Zach, you have, you know, a similar um, there's that that contest. Um, and, you know, I, I think thrillers have become more ubiquitous than they used to be. I mean, I've been doing crime fiction here for a really long time, and a lot of it used to be more more the more conventional police procedural or PI investigation or, you know, the kind of Agatha Christie style. But thrillers have increasingly taken over. And I think in part it's because we really like that um, that contest, you know, that that back and forth between the hero and the antagonist and the who will win question. So Bill, you've written a lot of historical fiction. Is that, is that part of what grabbed you in this was the idea of being able to do that, to follow this, um, you know, follow this manhunt, create this journey and have your, your assassin pitted up against these other people. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I heard a great quote once It comes from uh, Steve Berry. Uh, a well-known author. I'm sure you 
probably interviewed we, he Steve. Lives on, he, he lives on our website, yes. Now, we, yes. we do a lot with Steve, and he is a very interesting writer, I agree. Yep. Yeah, and Steve, Steve once said, uh, a mystery is about what has happened. A thriller is about what's going to happen. And um, and when, when you talk about a police procedural, well, the, mur the murder usually happens in the first uh, the first chapter. And uh, I I like this opportunity to tell you that something really bad may happen at the end of this book uh, and just hook you from the beginning with that knowledge and then drive the story forward from there. And I've even tried to do that with my historical novels. Uh, of December 41 covers two and a half weeks. Uh, Cape Cod, which is up over my shoulder there, which came out about 30 years ago, and I'm happy to say has never been out of print. Um, that covers about a, a thousand years of time. And yet it has, this. I hope, the same kind of uh, driving force behind it that uh, that December 41 has as well. Um, and uh, one of the central challenges to every novelist is to get people to keep turning pages uh, and keep turning them more and more quickly as the book goes along. And I believe that uh, that if I can keep making people turn pages through drama and suspense and that fear of what may happen on the next page or at the end of the book, um, I, I can keep doing this. And, you know, I've been at it now for 42 years. So uh, um, I think I, I think I've learned a few things along the way. Well, you certainly haven't lost your edge, um, as this book well says. But, you know, it, it's interesting. I mean, the dominant question in one form of, of um, fiction, you know, crime fiction anyway, is who did it? And yeah. another dominant question in a different form is why? Um, yeah. and, and rising up again is the locked room mystery and other, and that's how. How is the crime accomplished? But in a thriller, the central question is who will win? It's always yes. going to be who will win, you know, and that's what keeps everybody turning the pages as they drive towards, you know, the end to see which guy's going to come out, which of your people are going to come up on top and which events will take over. And it's, you know, it's more challenging, I think, when the real events are real and you have to create your story within that framework. Right. Um, but, you know, it's challenging for Zach to make it up, too, because you have to make it at least appear real or the reader will lose interest. So, they're different challenges, but I thought you did extremely well. I didn't mention that both of you have the same publisher, which I think yes. um, is interesting too. So, yes. you know what, guys? I think it must be really annoying for people to listen to my voice and not see me. So I am going to hand this over to Patrick, who has been monitoring questions and who probably has fabulous questions of his own because we usually do this as a team. So, P, can you take over from this? Sure. And I will sign off and fail it. But it's been a real pleasure, despite this ridiculous format, to talk to both of you. And I hope we can do it again when um, technology won't let us down. So good night, guys, and thank good you night, very Barbara. much. Thank you. Thank you, Thanks for having us. Thank you. Well, um, actually, we're almost at the end of the hour, but uh, actually, I do have a couple of questions for both of you. Um, Zach, I was really interested when you were talking, uh, you know, quite a bit earlier about how you know you viewed this this novel of yours as a uh, you didn't you didn't use the word protest novel, but as a almost an anti-war novel. Mm -hmm. I thought that was really interesting, you know, um, and uh, who were some of your, because there's, you know, as Barbara was talking, there, there are quite a bit of, you know, current military thriller writers out there, you know, you know, some really good ones too. I mean, you've got Mark Graney and, you know, some of, some of whom, like Mark wasn't in the service, you know, um, was just a really good writer and, uh, you know, any number of other ones, Brad Taylor, Brad Thor, you know, they're veterans who've been who've written, were there any um, sort of models or inspirations that you drew upon? Um, yeah, yeah, sort of. Uh, I read a variety of genres. I, I 
I was really influenced. One of my favorite science fiction writers is uh, Richard Morgan. And he wrote a near future thriller called Market Forces about the not too distant future. About um, he's like, a brilliant writer. I'll yeah, yeah, him. just very like awesome writer. But the story is about like these these investment firms that go around the world and and fund you know small wars across the globe in exchange for a portion of the country's gross domestic product. Um, but it was just, it's told, I mean, there are some lavish details to the story that, the, you know, they, the, uh, there's some sci- heavy sci-fi elements, but the, the near future element is really um, interesting there. But like you said, in traditional, I read a ton of traditional military thrillers. I mean, Wake of War is an anti-war novel, or at least ask the reader to really, truly consider what war is and what we're looking for. Like really think before you leap. Um, but like, you know, I love Mark Graney. Um, uh, Nick Petrie is another one. I think sure. he was, uh, it's more of like the, um, I think, uh, I can't, Peter Ash novels. Right. Peter Ash is a, is a veteran suffering from PTSD, but I don't, I believe Nick Petrie was in, in the service. But I mean, at the end of the day, I, I'm writing, I'm a writer. We're writers. We're all making this stuff up, whether it's influenced by reality or not. Um, and the hope is to just do the best to, to, make it believable um yeah now um bill just quickly kind of circling back um indulge me for a second because i find i find the whole you were talking about the the german presence in in los angeles and certainly in hollywood uh in the 30s you know that that hollywood was was thick with germans in the 30s you know a lot of the uh you know uh, you think about the the expressionist uh, German expressionist film movement, uh, and I find that fascinating, endlessly fascinating. You know, and you got Peter Lorre, and you got um, you know tons of different directors, and uh, and then you got all the fifth column kind of you know whisperings down below the border, you know, in Tijuana, and uh, just a well, fascinating they were, period. They were actually they were actually right on Figueroa and Fifteenth, right where the Staples Center is today. Uh, the German-American Bund had its Bund Hall right there, and uh, it becomes a location in the book. You could walk into the Bund Hall, and to your left was the Aryan Bookstore, where they sold cookbooks and German literature and all of the anti-Semitic material you could hope to find. To the right was the restaurant called the Gas Stube. Uh, where you could have all kinds of German delicacies. And on the wall, there was a map with pushpins showing the progress of the Wehrmacht across Russia. And directly across the the foyer, uh, occupying the bulk of the building, was uh, the auditorium where they celebrated Hitler's birthday every year with umpa bands and uh, portraits of the Fuhrer. Uh, these people were uh, heavily present in Southern California and south of the border. It was, uh, in fact, m- much easier for German agents to infiltrate via uh, the, the Long Beach docks than it was to get in through New York, mostly because the FBI was watching for them in New York. In Southern California, they were more concerned about communists. You remember the Grapes of Wrath and the fear of communism that that you see in Southern California at the time. And Hoover, J. Edgar Hoover was worried about the communists, not the Nazis. And so on every ship that came from Germany to Southern California in those, in those years, uh, there would be aboard some kind of Gestapo political agent who would be carrying cash and uh, and pamphlets and lots of other things that he would give to an agent from the Bund, who would then bring it back to L.A. and they would hatch some new plan to extend and expand the interest of uh, of Germans in Southern California and ultimately in the whole United States. So it was going on, and I found it endlessly fascinating to read about it and to fold it into the novel. And um, it gave it gave the book a real sense of 
verisimilitude right from the very beginning. You know what else is fascinating, at least to me, is that period just post-war where you have the CIA recruiting all these, you know, Nazi uh, scientists, you know, yes. some, some of whom yeah. were some of whom were real war criminals, you know, and putting them on the CIA payroll and, you know, sneaking them over here before the Russians got to them. Yeah, there, there might be a novel in that. I've been wondering about that. Yeah, yeah. Um, one of the questions that's come up, uh, for one thing, um, you know, the, the, the perennial question we always ask at the end of a program is, what are you guys working on now? What's your next project? So, uh, Zach, what, what do you got cooking? What's, what's next for you? So, what I, I'm, my next book is, uh, I've already turned it in to my editor. So, it's out of my hands. I'm plotting uh, the third book because this Wake of War is, uh, I was part of a three book deal. Wake of War is a standalone. So, the next book is not connected. Uh, it's uh, more of a sci-fi military thriller, and I'm kind of describing it as uh, Blade Runner meets Mission Impossible. So it's a little bit more escapist. It's not as heavy. Um, Wake of War is a story I wanted to tell, and now you know I'm writing something a little bit more um, adventurous. Wow, very cool. Yeah. Was, uh, was Philip K. Dick an, an influence to you at all? I'm oh, sure. yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I read a lot of the, you know, the Blade Runner and Andrew, or the Android's Dream of Electric Sheep. Sure. And, yeah um some of some of this you know i i can't say i love all of it but there are there's yeah. in there for sure but i mean it's a cla they're definitely classics that have inspired um you know the the genre right and the man in the high castle very different kind right. of story right uh but but yeah what a wonderful writer mm -hmm. um bill are you going to continue in your historical uh thriller vein well i think i think so i haven't quite decided what the next one will be uh, really um, you have um, anything working in progress. Well, I have a couple of a couple of ideas that I'm uh, that I'm pushing at, and one of them will be the one that I that I settle on soon in order to get a new book going. Uh, sometimes it takes a while, as I said earlier. Sometimes a book is a buried fossil. Uh, sometimes a book is a bolt of lightning, and um, as at, at the moment, I haven't found the fossil, and the lightning hasn't struck, but. Uh, I've been at this for I've been at this for a long time, and I am supremely confident in the fact that it will that it will happen again soon. Well, one of the questions you will, is, be, the, you will be the first to know. All right, one of the questions that's come in over the internet here uh, is from Russ, and um, let's see here. He says, uh, "Bill, I'm a big fan from Massachusetts. I know you do incredible research with each of your books." Is there one thing you learned while researching December 41 that you did not know prior to undertaking this book? Hmm. Probably quite a few things. Well, I didn't really know uh, how extensive the impact and the presence of uh, uh, the, the neo-fascists, uh, the German-Americans and all of their, uh, their friends, the Silver Shirt League, the Ku Klux Klan and all of those other groups actually were in Southern California in the 30s and early 40s uh, until I started doing this research. And I would have to say that's really the, uh, the thing that was the most impactful to me. Um, plus the fact, I suppose, that um, uh, you, the best thing to eat on the Santa Fe Super Chief was the French toast at breakfast. It was the most famous, you know, it was the most famous part of uh, part of the menu, so they said. And one of, one of the things I try to do is get the big things right, like the German American Bund's presence and impact in California, and get the smallest details accurate as well. And that means what were they eating on the train at breakfast? Have you both found that, that we have a tendency in our history to? Um how shall I say, kind of whitewash <laughs> the less savory aspects of history. I mean, I think about, you know, in the 30s, the eugenics movement was very prevalent, um, you know, and we like to downplay the anti-Semitic uh, sentiment that was going on in this country at that time as well. Right. Well, uh, I think that uh, the old line about history being written by uh, the victors is is accurate. Um, I also think that 
uh, part of my job and Zach's too is to uh, tell the truths that that we may not really be comfortable hearing because it's important to hear them. Yeah. Um, I've written books about the founding fathers, about the 18th century, and, and the, I wrote a novel about the life of George Washington, uh, which was told through 12, the eyes of 12 different narrators, and uh, the first narrator and the last narrator in the, this span of 67 years of Washington's life is the Mount Vernon slave who's in the room when he's born and is in the room when uh, when he dies. And somebody says later, you must have really loved him. He said, no, not particularly. Um, but he was decent enough to me. And my objective in writing like that was to tell you the truth of, of slavery in, uh, in American history and its role. And that's our job as novelists, is to show you um, human beings who have aspirations, and Washington surely had the best of aspirations, and who still may be flawed, and uh, whose flaws may somehow um, still affect us in a way, in our perception of them and in the way the country works. Right, and, and you make a good point. It's um, You have to be able to look at those those darker aspects and confront them. Cause if you ignore them or try to pretend they didn't exist or defend it in some, whatever wild ideology, you know, you can come up with, you're never going to learn to move beyond it. You're never going to learn to fix it or address these, these things in ourselves that, that obviously need to be addressed. It's, it's really important. It's like, uh, like addressing a wound, right? Like you can't, you can't do anything to fix the wound. If you don't first peel back the, the clothes and, and look at what happened, and then just figure out, you know, how to fix it. So that's right. Yeah. Exactly. I liked your, I liked your comment earlier, Zach, about how, um, you know, these two characters represented, um, you know, diametrically opposite points of view. Do you think, though, on some level, they represent the, you know, both sides of a single human? You mm -hmm. know, there's the shadow side that we all possess. Uh, so they're 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 in in all of us, both sides. Right. Absolutely. And and. A big takeaway is is your circumstance or where how you you know the influences that we are guided by in life that dictate our trajectory. Um, right. We have control over how we see and feel and react to the world around us. Um, oh, I'm, I forgot who said it. Um, I can't remember his name. And I'm sorry, but the quote. He uh, there's a quote and it, it for forgive me. I can't remember who said it, but. Um, there's uh, between stimulus and response is a space. And in that space, we have the power to choose how we act. Um, and that's sort of the, the question that I tried to arrive, you know, do with that. Like, you know, the characters had flipped sides. They'd be the same person. And I mean, it's the book is a civil war and it could, it could have wrote it about another country or a fictional country or, you know, you know, uh, you know, fighting an alien invasion, it, whatever it is. Uh, it, it has that separation, but making it about a civil war really brings it home because, I mean, whether you're fighting, whether it's Americans fighting Americans or Americans fighting another nation, we're all human beings and whatever ideologies we're surrounded by kind of dictate our paths and how we either come together. Do we come together peacefully and productively or do we come together aggressively? So, so we're really fighting yeah. ourselves in some way. Uh, sure. Yeah. It's funny. I recently reread, uh, uh, that sh very short um, little novella, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, you know, by Stevenson. And I was thinking, God, what a what a central book that should, you know, that really is, you know, uh, it's very deep ramifications of that story, you mm. know, of the shadow. But anyway, I digress. Uh, it's been a treat uh, talking and listening to you, gentlemen. Um, congratulations, Zach, on on the release of your debut novel, Wake of War. Thank awesome. You. Thank and you, thank uh, you. Congratulations, Bill, on your wonderful new book, December 41. Thank um, you, Patrick. Yeah. And thanks, everybody, for, for watching this evening. I um, uh, hope you guys have a wonderful evening, and um, we'll talk to you again soon, hopefully. Well, thank you Great. very much for having me. It was a pleasure. 
You Great bet. to meet you all.